Welcome to video lecture E12. This one is on linear independence in theory. So this is the second video lecture so far on linear independence and dependence. So this will be a slightly more theoretical take on things, but also with some practical implications. I'd like us to understand, come to grips with the idea of linear independence informally as characterizing whether certain vectors are redundant in terms of creating linear combinations. In other words, if you have a set of vectors and you can make, a linear com make some linear combinations to get some other vectors, could you get those other vectors with fewer starting vectors? I'll give you a concrete example in a minute. Um, and we'll analyze the reasoning behind the following statement, which is that um, the definition of a set of vectors as being linearly dependent is the same thing as saying that one vector can be written as a linear combination of others in the set. So here I should say the definition of linear dependence. Um, and I'll state that quite carefully for you in just a second. So this is a quick reminder. At this point, you've already memorized this definition, so I'm just going to flash this on the screen and it's going to go away in a second. But remember that a set of vectors, v1 through vp, is called linearly independent if that vector equation, if I can put coefficients in front of all those vectors and get zero, but I can't have all the coefficients be zero, which would be trivial. That would be too easy, right? So if it's linear dependent if I can do that, and it's linearly independent if the only way to get zero is by making all the coefficients zero. Okay, so the two definitions go hand in hand. The set of vectors is either linearly dependent or independent. Um, and if it's linearly dependent, then we can write down a linear dependence relation. Okay, so let's look at the following theorem. So the claim is that if I've got a set of at least two vectors, then it's linearly dependent if and only if at least one vector is a linear combination of the others. Okay? So at least one vector is a linear combination of the others means that a set of, vector of, more of at least two vectors has to be linearly dependent. And in fact, I can say even more. If I know that the first vector is not the zero vector, if it was the zero vector, I would know it's linearly dependent right away. I wouldn't have to think anymore. But if, I, if the first vector is not zero, which it generally won't be, then um, that means that I can always find, as I'm going along, I can say, OK, can I write v2 as a linear combination of v1? Well, maybe not. But can I write v3 as a linear combination of v1 and v2? And you keep trying this successively. Can I write v4 as a linear combination of v1, v2, and v3? If it's linearly dependent, there will be some j, there will be some value where um, you can write v sub j as some linear combination of v1 through uh, v1 through vj minus 1. That should probably be a plus there. There's no reason for that to be a minus rather than a plus, where the di are scalar. So for us, that means real numbers. OK, so here's the proof. Suppose that v1 is not equal to 0. Uh, we can do a separate argument when v1 is equal to 0. And suppose that my linear dependence relation is this guy, c1 v1 plus dot 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 plus cp vp equals 0. Right? If they're linearly dependent, then there has to be a linear dependence relation. And not all of these c sub i's are 0. So some of them are non-zero. What's the largest one that's non-zero? Maybe cp is 0, but cp minus 1 is non-zero. Or maybe I have to go down to cp minus 2. But in any case, I let cj be the largest index such that cj is not equal to 0. So I should really say let j be the largest index such that cj is not equal to 0. Right? It's j is the index, and c sub j is that thing. So if j is the largest index such that cj is not equal to 0 in the linear dependence relation, then when I move all the previous terms, so, so that part goes away, the part that's cj plus 1 and above, because they were all 0. So all I'm left with is I can just write, take cj vj and write it in terms of all the ones that came before, negative c1 v1 minus dot 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 minus cj minus 1 vj minus 1. Now if I divide through by cj, then I'll get that v sub j is equal to negative c1 over cj times v1 minus dot 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 minus um, cj minus 1 divided by cj vj minus 1. I know that cj was not equal to 0, so I could divide through it and I'm done. Okay, So I've shown that if it's linearly dependent, then I can always write some vector v sub j as a linear combination of the previous ones. 
Now, remember, I actually made an assumption that v1 was not equal to 0. So what happens if v1 is equal to 0? Well, if v1 is equal to 0, then v1 can be written as, well, I mean, the, the, the 0 linear combination of all the other vectors is 0. And so what does that mean? If I move that over to the other side, um, then I get a linear dependence relation. Um, oh, I guess, right. So I can write, so what I'm saying here is that I can write v1 as a linear combination of the other vectors, which is my general statement, right? I can always write at least one vector's linear combination of the other ones. If v1 is not equal to 0, then I can always make it in terms of the previous ones, but if v1 is equal to 0, then I can just write it as the zero linear combination of the other guys. Now let's look at the opposite argument, right? This is an if and only if statement, which means I have to prove it this way and that way. So if I want to prove it the other way, then I'm assuming that v sub j can be written somehow as the sum of di vi, where um, so all of the other terms here, right? So all of the summing over all the i's which are not equal to j, right? So that's writing one vector, vector's linear combination of the others, but now I just move the vj over to the other side of the equation. And that gives me a linear dependence relation whose coefficient of vj is minus 1, which is not equal to 0. Okay? So really all this is is an algebraic rewriting. And you might ask, well, why didn't we define linearly dependent to mean that I could write one vector in terms of the others? It turns out that, you know, exactly for the reason that I have to take a couple of cases in this argument, it, it becomes mathematically less easy to work with. So it's easier to work with the definition of linear dependence and independence that we're using here. Um, and by making the theory easier to understand, we make the mathematics easier to understand and easier to use. So that's, that's the case for using this particular definition. But these things didn't happen, uh, it didn't spring full blown from Zeus's head. It's a definitions are usually codified and agreed upon or sometimes disagreed upon by mathematicians over many years. And so people were, for, were thinking about these ideas for a long time before they came up with the modern 20th century definition of linear dependence and independence that we use all the time now. Okay. Anyway, bottom line, that's what linear dependence is, uh, means, and it basically means that some of your vectors are redundant if it comes to ma making linear combinations. So let's take a look at this running example we've had before. So we've seen this matrix A before, and we saw in the last video lecture that um, it had a homogeneous solution, which were multiples of 2, negative 1, 1. And in fact, if we just take, say, 2, negative 1, 1 and make that linear combination of these columns, we get 0. So what does that mean? That means exactly that we can rewrite A3. If we move, A3, if we move everything else to the other side, we can write A3 as negative 2 times a1 plus a2, right? If we'd had some coefficient on a3, if there had been a 7 in front of this, or a 6, a 7, say, then we would have just divided by it, and we would have gotten negative 2 7 a1 plus a plus uh, uh, 1 7 a2. Okay, so we can rewrite one vector as a linear combination of the others. So what? Well, this actually lets us simplify our linear combinations in some sense. So suppose we know, and you can easily check this is true, that the vector, I'm writing it as, instead of writing it as a column, which just takes too much space on, the, on these small slides, I'm writing it this way, 11, 25, 17. But you can imagine that's 11, 25, 17. Suppose I know that that's some linear combination, this linear combination, two of these plus three of these minus two of those. And you can check that that's actually true then, unless I made a carefully planned mistake to see if you were paying attention, um, then the point is that I can now replace a sub 3. I can rewrite a sub 3 as negative 2a sub 1 plus a sub 2 because that's true by this, right? So if I just replace that here, then I get that this guy, same, same output, is instead of being a linear combination of these three vectors, can be written as a linear combination of the two vectors, right? So I put in negative 2a1 plus a2 here, I multiply by 2 and I combine like terms and I end up with 6a1 plus a2. Now, of course, whenever you get an answer like this, you always check it. You shouldn't trust me or, or even yourself. I don't trust myself. So let's just check 6a1 plus a2. So what happens? If I take 6 times this plus this, I get 11. Oh, that's good. If I take 6 times 3, that's 18 plus 7 is 25. 
And if I take 6 times 2, that's 12 plus 5 is 17. So indeed, 11, 25, 17 can be written as a linear combination of just these two vectors. I don't need all three. So I hope that's, there's some intuition there that you can sort of start to see, OK, if I'm trying to figure out what vectors I need to span a certain set of, if I want to span a certain set of vectors, I might have some vectors that aren't helping me out, that aren't doing me, giving me any extra information. They're not creating new combinations as they go. And so this is an example where the 3, 1, 1 is not creating new combinations for me once I already have the 1, 3, 2, or the 5, 7, 5. One quick point to make here is that I didn't, it, it isn't necessarily the A3 that I, I, it's not A3 that has to be thrown out. I could have thrown out A, A1 or A2 in this situation because any one of these can be written as a linear combination of the other two. So I could write, for example, A1 as uh, a half of this minus a half of that. And then I could replace in any thing where I have all three of these things in a linear combination, I could replace A1 with a half of this plus a half of that and write the whole thing in terms of just A2 and A3. Okay. Uh, it won't always be true that it's completely symmetric. Sometimes, you know, if one is a scalar multiple of another, then you just pick one or the other, but you can't throw out some other vector necessarily. So it's, a, it's not completely straightforward. All right, but so here's another way of thinking about this. So being able to write some vector, b1, b2, b3, like 11, 25, 17, as a linear combination of these three vectors is the same thing as saying that this homogeneous system of equations has a solution. Actually, sorry, in homogeneous, right? So we're trying to get the output b1, b2, b3. And so this augmented matrix here, suppose it had 11, 25, 17 here, this does have a solution. But the point is that 1, 3, 2, 5, 7, 5, b1, b2, b3, that, all, that has a solution already. So I didn't need to have the 3, 1, 1 there. It wasn't helping me. All right. So that's the, um, an example of how you could think about linearly dependent vectors mean that there's somebody who's not pulling their weight or they're, or they're not pulling any new weight. Um, you don't need them to get the job done. Okay. So another way of phrasing that more mathematically precisely is, so what we're saying here is that if a1, a2, and a3 are the columns of these vectors, that the span of a1, a2, a3, the set of things I can get by taking linear combinations of these three vectors, is the same as just the span of the first two. Okay. The span of the three vectors is the same as the span of the first two. So that's, the, that's this example. So now let's uh, try to separate uh, truth from falsehoods. Uh, one of the nice things about being a mathematician is that there's a very clear sense of right and wrong, and it's not a question of like alternative facts or anything like that. Um, although that isn't to say that people don't sometimes make mistakes. So I'll try not to make any mistakes here. Um, so the first true and false is suppose that one vector is a scalar multiple of another vector. Then does that mean that the set S is linearly dependent or not? Okay, and so the answer to the first one is true. Right, because if we know that that u2 is a scalar multiple of u1, so then that means that u2 is equal to say some vector, I'll just call some scalar, I'll just call it k times u1, then that implies that um, k u1 minus u2 equals 0, and that's a linear dependence relation. Okay, so 1 is true. Let's look at 2. True or false, if a set u1, u2 is linearly dependent, then u2 is a multiple of u1. So you might think this is true, but you have to be careful, right? Because what's true is that if it's linearly dependent, then one is a multiple of the other. But you don't necessarily know which one. If they're both non-zero, then you can just move the scalar. Or you can replace the scalar with its reciprocal. But the trick is that u1 could be zero here, right? So 2 is false.
sense. So if you want to show something's false, it's always best to take a specific counterexample. So let's, um, let's take u1 equals, say, 0, 0, and u2 equals any non-zero thing, say 1, 0, right? Then this set is linearly dependent because it has the zero vector in it. That's one of our theorems, and we understand why that's true. But there's no way to make 1, 0 a scalar multiple of 0, 0, right? Because any multiple of 0, 0 is 0. Okay, so you might say, ah, that's kind of dumb. But sometimes you have to be careful about these dumb things in mathematics, these things that don't seem like they, they come up all the time because they'll trip you up when you, when you least expect it. So what is true? I mean, if you, sometimes you can think about how to salvage a statement like this. So a salvage for this would be, you know, if you assume that u1 and u2 are both not equal to the zero vector. So if they're both not equal to the zero vector, then this statement would be true because, right, then you would have something like, so then your linear dependence relation would be something like C1 U1 plus C2 U2 equals zero. And let's see, how do we argue from here? Well, neither of these vectors is zero. So that means that um, that means that they're linearly independent by themselves. So there's no way you can you could just have c1 u1 equal to zero or c2 u2 equal to zero unless c1 or c2 was, was zero. So now if you did have and so if c1 so say say if c1 were zero then that would mean you'd have c2 u2 equals zero but that would mean c2 had to be zero as well. So that's that wouldn't be a, a linear dependence relation because at least one of these guys has to be non-zero. Right? So now you can say, all right, so now at least one of these guys is non-zero. So um, C1 not equal to zero implies that I get U1 equals minus C2 over C1 U2. But by the same reasoning, you can show that C2 can't be 0, and you get U2 equals uh, minus C1 over C2, U1. All right, so these guys are just reciprocals of one another. All right, one more. True or false, if the equation Ax equals B has a solution other than the trivial solution, then the columns of A are linearly dependent. So think for a second. So this one's a little bit tricky because if instead of B here I'd written 0, it would be true. But because I wrote B here, there's, it doesn't have to be true, right? Because the point is that you want to find a a non-trivial solution to the homogeneous system, and this is not the homogeneous system. So then you say to yourself, okay, well, how do I come up with a counterexample here? Um, let's see. So I want something that has a solution other than that, but the columns of A are linearly dependent. Well, let, let, let's pick, so we want to show something where the columns of A are linearly independent, and there's a solution. So just take something really simple, like say A equals, 1, 0, 0, 1. This is sometimes called the identity matrix. And right, it's certainly true that, um, so what's true about, maybe I'll call it i, because that's what we usually call it. So call this i. What's true about i is that i x is always equal to x. Okay, so if I want to solve a x equals b, I just take x is actually equal to b itself, right? So, so i times b equals b, so therefore that's a solution, right? I mean, just to, to pick a particular example, I could take b is equal to, say, 2, 3, right? Then 1, 0, 0, 1 times 2, 3 
is equal to 2, 3. Okay? So there is a solution, and it's not the trivial solution, but these columns, 1, 0, and 0, 1, are li definitely linearly independent, right, as you can check because um, when you row reduce it, there are no free variables. Okay, so that's, a, that's another example. And finally, here's the fourth example. What happens if I've got a set w1, w2, w3, and I know that that's linearly independent, then can I say anything about a set with, where I add another vector in? Right? And the answer to this is, think about it for a second. I've got a linear dependence relation for these three vectors. Can I find a linear dependence relation for those four vectors? Right, and so the answer is clearly yes, right? Because if I have, um, if C1W1 plus C2W2 plus C3W3 equals zero is my linear dependence relation, whatever where you know, so not all CIs are equal to zero, right? That's what it needs to be a linear dependence relation for the set W1, W2 over three, then what do I do? I'll just take C1W1 plus C2W2 plus C3W3 plus I'll just multiply zero times W4 and that'll be zero. So this is a linear dependence relation for the larger set, w1, w2, w3, w4. All right, so that wraps it up for the initial understanding of linear dependence and independence. I hope this made some sense. Feel free to um, send feedback or ask your recitation leader if you have any questions. And as always, thank you for your kind attention.